as long as you know that you're doing less work at greater intensities than you were doing before, and as long as you know you have enough time to recover without detraining before the meet, that's all you gotta worry about. What's going on guys, it's Bronwyn from Empire Barbell, and today we're gonna cover how I prep for contests. And this is gonna give you some information that should be applicable to your sport, not just what I do, which is strongman. A lot of these foundations are rooted in powerlifting and Olympic lifting, and we've taken them and kind of repurposed them for all of the other events and, and kind of the complex arrangement of movements that we have to get ready for to do well come contest day. So real quick, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, we're gaining followers like crazy, and the more subscribers I get, the more time I can spend turning out content because this is just what I wanna do all the time. So we're putting out three to four videos a week. You don't wanna to have to play catch up. So go ahead and uh, hit the notification bell and get it when it comes out. So it's Tuesday morning. We leave Wednesday to go to beautiful Montgomery, Alabama. Me and my beautiful wife, Laura, are both in the middle of a weight cut right now. So we're just finishing our water loading. Uh, once we land tomorrow, we go to the hotel. We brought our portable sauna. We got plastics. Uh, we're gonna get creative with ways to sweat. We're gonna spend all day Wednesday sweating. Way in Thursday, we got a day to refeed and then we compete Friday and Saturday. So we had five events. Uh, we have two static events, the deadlift and log clean and press. The deadlift is for max, which is very rare. Uh, max deadlift, uh, actually I've never heard of a max deadlift being at a Nationals or a Strongman Corp show just because they take a lot longer to run and there's so many athletes. Uh, the log is a clean and press each rep, which means it has to be taken out of the ground every time. Uh, it's 290 for me, it's 140 for Laura. Um, then there's a 700 pound yoke run, uh, 60 feet down, 60 feet back, so that's gonna be a foot race. We have a uh, bag toss, uh, 15 feet for me, 12 feet for Laura. Mine's 35 to 50 pound bags, four of them. Laura's is 20 to 35. Uh, and then we have a Hussefeld stone run for max distance, which is absolutely horrible. That's the last event on day one. And uh, 375 pound Hussefeld stone, hers is 220. And you just take it till you die. So you can see that we have a lot of different types of thresholds we have to flesh out. And that's what makes strongman programming so fun slash infuriating because you have conflicting things. Uh, where powerlifting is pretty one dimensional, you don't need your fitness high. In fact, dropping fitness is part of the peak. Uh, we have to maintain a certain level of fitness in uh, often conflicting areas. So you have to get a little creative with how you handle fatigue as you get closer to the meet. So to start this off, you have to understand that the whole idea behind a peak is that it's the assumption that there is a certain amount of fatigue built up. Not just fatigue because you're tired because you just did a set, but kind of a general fatigue from the amount of work that encompasses a week. If you've ever worked, uh, let's say a manual labor job, you know how you feel your fourth and fifth day in before the weekend, all that fatigue accumulates, right? It's not just the work you just did. It's the same idea with training. The weekly work compounds and it bleeds into each week, especially if you're making the stressors greater and greater and greater. So the idea is that if you're working hard enough to grow, if the stress is great enough to cause an adaptation, it's also great enough to limit your ability to express how good you really are. So by lowering fatigue as we get closer to a meet, we allow for a type of recovery and it's, it should be the only part in your training cycle where you are actually 100% fatigued in such a way that you can actually express 100% of your physical abilities. So the idea is that fatigue masks your physical capabilities. So we drop fatigue, we lower the amount of work, we lower the stress, and then your performance climbs as you recover. Now this is mind numbing for a lot of newer lifters who get anxious the closer they get to the meet. So rule number one is first do no harm, that's it. When I start with the contest week, I'm making sure that I'm not gonna screw myself up. And the way people screw themselves up is by getting uh, anxious and fidgety and they wanna go in and just try it one more time before the contest just to make sure. And that's what leads people to take like their openers two days before the meet. That's what leads people, like right now, I'm going crazy over the bag toss because it's my worst event. And I just wanna go throw bags to make sure that I know my setup and I'm, I'm good with it, but you can't do that. I'm two days out from competing. I have to rest, I have to recover. So that's thing one. Now, if your training was hard enough going into those weeks, those last couple weeks of recovery should bring with it a nice big peak in all of these lists. So the important thing is knowing how to time it. So these different qualities all have a different time threshold associated with them because they detrain at a different rate. So I might recover, 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 get stronger, but if I continue recovering, that leads to detraining, which is not what we want. So strength, just pure absolute strength, hangs around for about three weeks. So that's an important thing to know. So 
the Russians figured out that if you do absolutely nothing, three weeks in, you're still about as strong as you were when you stopped. Now, you will be out of shape. You won't be conditioned. And that's an important thing to know too, because conditioning leaves you a lot faster, but you also gain it a lot faster. So that means that I'm going to stop my heaviest workouts further out and my more endurance or capacity-based workouts, I'm going to carry that closer to the meat. Also, it's important to know that maintenance is extremely easy. If I'm trying to keep up on my endurance, that doesn't mean I have to do the hardest, heaviest thing I can do. I don't have to actually do the contest run through. But let's say a log clean and press for reps, if my weight is 290 for a minute, and I'm trying to fit in eight or nine reps in that time, to keep my capacity up, I just have to maintain my strength and maintain my endurance in that threshold, which means if I do anything for that duration, if I, I could do 200 for a minute and fill out the minute with work, and that's still gonna have some carryover, that's still gonna maintain my endurance capabilities, which is important for recovery because I get to get the benefit of maintaining without actually having to go as hard as I can. So these last couple of weeks where I've really focused on recovery, that's really important to know. So this isn't the whole progression and I'm not getting into to details about sets, reps, and all that because they're all so different and in strongman, they're going to be different based on minor differences from event to event. I'm going to program a heavy 50 foot yoke walk a lot differently than I'm going to program a medley or that I'm going to program, let's say a race for longer distance. So they're all different. So conceptually, you just need to understand the percentages that pretty much corresponds to relative to the contest weight. So I break everything off into static lifts and events. Uh, the static lifts, uh, deadlift and overhead press is pretty universal. Occasionally you'll see a squat, but that's kind of rare. And these are a fixture anyways, because they're main developmental movements, because I want to get those good, regardless of what I have coming up in the contest. Now, if there isn't a deadlift, I'm probably not going to deadlift at all, you know, three or four weeks out from the meet, just so I can focus on event stuff. But there almost always is, so it always stays in. I do it on a different day. One of the reasons I like doing deads on Tuesday or Wednesday is because I like about 10 to 12 days of no deadlifting. So if we compete on Friday or Saturday, if my last deadlift is the Wednesday or Tuesday before, that coincides really well with my preferred amount of recovery. So that's one thing that I keep in. A lot of guys will do their deadlifts on event day. I hate that. I don't really stress out about event order or doing all the events in one day. If you're getting a total weekly amount of training and you're adapting to those movements uh, and you're doing multiple run throughs, the contest day is still gonna be easy for you. And if there is one event, let's say there's a death medley you know, right before the deadlift, there's not a lot you can do save just getting in good general shape to, to really mitigate that fatigue. So training's gonna be the same anyway. So I don't really stress out about doing events in the exact same order on the exact same day. Um, this is a two day event we're getting ready for. So you have a lot of people that are doing the three events on one training day and the two events on the other. And I think that's unnecessarily complicated, but that's just me. So with the events, I have to consider which ones are heavy and which ones are endurance based. Those tend to be the two to different types of thresholds that you're gonna be working. Heavy just means power. It means I'm not gonna be up against my endurance. I'm not gonna reach failure on anything. It means I'm just trying to go as fast as I can or as heavy as I can. So for us, I count the yoke. It's a 700 pound yoke down and back. Now that might sound heavy, but the winner is gonna get 19 or 20 seconds. Uh, and I'm fighting for those couple of seconds right there. So that's a power event. I'm not up against a long threshold. I'm not getting close to failure there. Uh, the bag toss is another one, even though the bags aren't you know, heavy, it's a power event. So that's what I consider heavy. Uh, endurance is gonna be like the Hussefeld stone and the log press, because those I'm trying to go as hard as I can for a set period of time. The log I have to clean and press for a minute straight. The Hussefeld I go until I drop. So that's a different threshold and I need to make sure I keep those qualities fresh closer to the meat. Consequently, they also tend to not beat you down systemically to the to the same degree that, that heavier power-based events do. Um, I could do a pretty hard Hussefeld run a couple times a week and be okay. You're pretty blown out afterwards, but it doesn't tend to carry over to the next workout. Whereas, you know, you all know deadlifts really take it out of you. Even when you feel good, they'll impact recovery on other events. So that's important to know. So going down the uh, method of progression, I prefer to follow a three-week type wave it just makes more sense to me. It's easier to run. I just move linearly up for three weeks. And then at that point, it's either a deload or some way of dropping the work back and then progressing again. So that's just how I get planned recovery in. So I just have these staggered. So if I'm starting with contest day, a week out, I'm just recovering. Like right now, we're right here. I'm water loading. We fly out tomorrow. I'm traveling. You can get a deload workout in, but you don't have to. My last workout's usually six or seven days out from the contest. Um, 
I make sure that my last event day before the contest, about a week out, has the capacity work in. So that's where I was focusing on 100% with the contest weight for the Husfeld Stone and the Log Press. And I do a reduced workout on the heavy event. Now, what we've experimented with, a lot of newbies can get away with doing a full heavy contest run seven days out. Some of our better competitors got really good results when they do it two weeks out and then do a, a reduced run through a week before. And that tends to play into the taper very well. So that's how I structure it. So I stagger the endurance events down closer to the meet. Heavier events, we finish our heavy events a little further out and then focus on recovery. Um, for a max deadlift, I treat that differently than a deadlift for reps. I'd like a heavy deadlift, a hard deadlift, about 10 to 12 days out. If it's reps, I'll do the contest weight for reps 12 days out and then recover. If it's max, I get a little more dodgy just because I have a bad experience with max deadlifts. That's where all my injuries came, uh, came from. So even now that I feel good with it, I still always say a prayer before I pull heavy. So I prefer a variation, something where I know I'm not going to risk injury, but I'm still going to subject myself to weight. So I like reverse band. So, so last week I did a uh, reverse band deadlift with 675. Um, it's much easier to recover from, but I still get that weight at the top. So your nervous system still gets uh, really dialed in. The week before I did a 700, or sorry, a 705 deadlift, a straight weight to contest specifications. And then before that, it was just a linear buildup. I did 685 before that, 665 before that. Uh, so that's kind of how I wave. Now log is, is a similar buildup for me. Um, I was doing it on two different days. I cut it out towards the end because uh, I have tendonitis issues in my shoulder. So I don't have to do a lot. My overhead's always really good. I don't have to force the issue. So when I'm not feeling good, I always err on the side of recovery. So I just take away the excess work, the heavy work, and I just focus on the contest threshold and I'm good. I'm probably gonna win this event. Uh, it's just a really strong one for me. And uh, I know that I can take those liberties uh, instead of just pushing, 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 getting injured. It's nice knowing I can take my foot off the gas, recover, and then I'm still gonna be okay. So the last couple of weeks I just focused uh, on it as an endurance component and just focus on taking something close to the contest weight, filling out a minute, make sure my timing was good. There's a lot of precision. There's a cadence you have to follow to be able to get as many reps into a minute as possible. Uh, the weight is 290. The last few years they've had 280 to 300 as a staple at these types of events. Uh, the winner usually gets six. Uh, I can only think one time somebody got seven at a 280 log. I knocked out six in about 30 seconds, so I feel pretty good about this one. So then there's the accessories. Uh, the accessories I follow a little more linearly. They don't necessarily have to move in lockstep. I mean, in general, if you have a recovery week with the deadlift, you're not gonna blow yourself out on accessories. So they should coincide a little bit, but I really just start lightweight, a lot of sets and reps. So light, high volume, and I go to medium, medium, and then I go to heavy, low volume, and then the week before I cut it out. So this last week before the contest week is literally just deadlift and event training, and that's it. And if you can adhere to this principle, if you can start with more work at the top, progress down, hit your numbers in a predictable fashion, and then once fatigue starts to build and you handle your heaviest weights, cut the workout, intensity high, effort high, the amount of work you're doing is low. That's, that's the basic idea of a taper. And if you can actually recover without getting in your own way, you're gonna find that come contest day, you are going to feel fast, you are going to feel conditioned, you're going to feel strong, and that's what we're doing here. So this is how I put together my events. I always start with the event day, and then I reverse engineer how my progression is going to go after that. Everything I do above this like four or five week block is more base building. So it's more variations. Uh, I'm doing a lot more sets and reps. Uh, I typically start at a lighter percentage. I like to take my time before I start to get heavy just because I can run pretty much at any given time of the year with a 700 pound yoke. Doesn't mean that I start 10 weeks out with a 700 pound yoke because that just beats up my knees and my lower back. So instead I like to do variations. We were doing high step yoke walks uh, where we chop our feet, get our knees really high, focus on keeping the yoke from moving side to side. So that's an example. You can use lighter weight, but it's still somewhat difficult to find your movement patterns. Uh, for log, I was actually doing jerks early on. Shoulder was a little raw, so I decided that a jerk took stress off that first part of the push that really aggravates my shoulder, and I still got underweight. So I was able to work that for a couple weeks, refine my jerk, and then once it felt better, I added in more press volume. I picked selections that 
kind of round out my press but don't aggravate issues and then by the time i'm down here it's really just log pressing and that's it so that's periodization in a nutshell it's almost always going to be well linear periodization high volume a lot of variations relatively lightweight moving into more specificity over time dropping the amount of work you're doing ultimately before recovering and then going into the meat it is that simple don't think that there is some special magic checkbox you have to hit as long as you know that you're doing less work at greater intensities than you were doing before and as long as you know you have enough time to recover without detraining before the meet that's all you got to worry about it's a little specific to everybody everybody's on a different uh recovery path and that's perfectly okay that's why it doesn't even matter if you work with a coach there's still no substitute for trial and error so you got to know what your path of progression looks like what your time frame looks like and then work around that so that's all i got today guys i'll keep you updated with how we do uh going out like i said my wife laura we're going out with andrew mock and eric king we're both nasty middleweights uh, we have 80 people in our uh, division. I think 78 last I looked. I believe there's 76 heavyweights. So all in all, between all the women's and men's divisions, we're looking at over 300 people. It's going to be nuts. So uh, I'll keep everybody posted with the contest results. Uh, now I just got to get through this weight cut. So that's all I got for today, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley Empire Barbell. I'll see you.